Good morning. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hey, how are you? Good. Okay. Good, Perfect. good. I just yeah. finished with my <laughs> lab <laughs> teaching lessons. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, can we start for the lecture? Just yes, um, anytime. Yeah, anytime you want. You wish. It's perfect. Yes. Perfect. So, Andy, can you start this um event? Uh, yes, possibly. We are waiting for Parif because okay. he is moderator for today's uh, lecture. So I still contact him to join the debating first. I mean, second. Sorry, Professor. Yeah, okay, no. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So in Indonesia, we have a different so much uh, desert situation in Saudi Arabia. We have so much plants here. Can we start the, our lecture today? Professor Alexander? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, all the invitation participants. Good morning, Professor Alexander Rosado. Nice morning. to meet you all today. Welcome to the second session of the three in one program, guest lecture in microbiome, with the topic is bacteria from extreme environment as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria or PGPR. And my name is Andy Gorniawan, the uh, MC for today's uh, lecture. So, the first, Manorable, the head of the Department of Plant Pests and Disease, Dr. Lukman Rotaini, SPMSI, PhD, and then the guest lecturer for today's uh, activity, Professor Alexander Suarez Rosado from the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and all the lecturers, staff, and students who join uh, today's uh, lecturer activity. So our sequences of today's agenda is the first main session of guest lecture led by moderator Papa Arif Delphiawan PhD, and the second is discussion session. So in this session, I encourage the participant to ask the questions, and you may raise your hand and or drop the question in the chat column in this Zoom meeting. And the third is closing by the moderator. So we move, before we go to the main agenda, I will invite all the participants to do the documentation. So for this session, I encourage, uh, I ask all the participants to turn on the camera, please. And maybe, Master Dick, may you help us to take the documentation? Mas Dedi or Mas Faldi? Oke, 
Okay, ready to snap. Okay. Is it finished, Udita? Yes, finished. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So before we move uh, to the main agenda, I will remind all of you to fill the form of attendance in the link that maybe has been shared in the chat column for all of the participants for today's lecture. So before we start the lecture, I would like to read the curriculum PT or CP of today's moderator. So Papa Arif Delfiawan, so maybe Udita may help to show the the CV of so Papa Arif Delfiawan is lecturer at the Forestry Program Study for the Department Faculty of Agriculture, University of Brawijaya. So his educational background, he got a doctoral degree from UGSAS Gifu University, Japan, and then Magister in from the Shizuka University and the Bachelor from the Institute Pertanian Bogor. And his research interest is focused on the forest product technology and then bio, uh, bio composite and then biomass utilization, environment and forest resource science, and science of biological resources. And his selected publication is focused on the effect of food particle size distribution on the mechanical properties of wood plastic compost, and then the influence of tiller characterization on the physical and mechanical properties of wood plastic compound. And some awards he got is such as honorable mention in the 55th Canon Photo Contest 2021, and an excellence award in the 40th and HK World Japan Photo Contest 2021, and then top winner on the Pindle My Travel Story Contest 2021. And his experience is oral presentation in the 15th International Symposium, and then oral presentation in invited speakers at 72nd annual meeting of the Japanese, Japanese Society of Wood Science. So I will hand over this session to our moderator for today's lecture. So Papa Arif, time is yours and thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank for our distinguished master of ceremony, uh, Pak Andi, for providing me with this wonderful opportunity. With all due respect, I greet you with the universal message of peace. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, and I extend my best wish to all in attendance today. I hold the highest regard to our department head, uh, Pak Lukman, esteemed lecturers, committee chairs, committee members, and all the attendees. Uh, joining us for this guest lecture. First, uh, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Arif Delfiawan. I am a junior lecturer in the forestry study program. Uh, we did the soil department at the Faculty of Agriculture, Brawijaya University. I am privileged to be the moderator for this afternoon session. Uh, in our previous lecture last week, we dealt into the fascinating topic of microbiome in extreme environment. Today, uh, in the second of three in one guest lecture series, we will explore the next level theme. It's about bacteria from extreme environment as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, PGPR. We are honored to have uh, Prof. Alexander. Saros Rosado, uh, may I call you pa Alex for the next? Yeah, sure. Uh, from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, with us to uh, sit light on this subject. Before we proceed, I would like to introduce uh, pa Alex. Uh, please show the curriculum vitae. Okay. 
Profesor uh, Alex is a graduate from uh, Wageningen University uh, in 1997 for PhD microbiology and for master micro microbiology uh, graduate in Brazil 1989 uh, now he is a professor in King Abdullah University of Science and Technology uh, affiliation in bioscience and environmental science and engineering so that's for uh, introducing uh, Pak Alex uh, for distinguished curriculum vitae uh, now I invite Pak Alex to comment his lecture. You have approximately one hour uh, and the time is yours, uh, Pak Alex. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again. It's a huge pleasure um, to be here uh, once more. And I will take this uh, uh, opportunity uh, to to share a little bit uh, more about uh, some of my visions and some of uh, recent research that is uh, been going on uh, microbes and uh, particularly in uh, extreme microbes and how can we leverage the power of those extreme microbes trying to uh, foster you know a soil and a global framework towards uh, sustainability. I will start sharing uh, my screen. Let's see if it works. Can you see? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, today, my idea is that to keep again informal, so we can keep our uh, conversation more informal, and uh, and I will try to uh, to explain a little bit about uh, how can we. Uh, leverage or can we uh, use the power of extreme microbes in several different applications uh, but targeting and focusing on uh, uh, plant growth promoting rhizo microbes or rhizobacteria but i will also uh, um, uh, show uh, some case studies uh, uh, that we are uh, trying to understand a little bit more over here uh, about uh, extreme fungi and how can we uh, try to understand those uh, very extreme uh, microbes? And how can we maybe uh, apply those microbes in some very important biotech uh, applications, include plant growth in several different situations? Uh, microbes, they are extremely uh, important. Uh, we we uh, Microbial life represents the majority of Earth uh, biodiversity. And we are just beginning to scratch the surface of this uh, huge diversity that we are now uh, being able to shed light on the, the, you know, the dimension and extension of this uh, microbial diversity that we have in our planet. Um, they are here since the beginning. So the first uh, life forms, the first microbial life forms, the first bacteria or, or, uh, life forms, they... Uh, they are here, I mean, uh, since uh, 3.8 billion years ago. So they are quite old, quite ancient microbes. And since then they are thriving and they are spreading and they are connecting, they are interacting uh, with, with uh, each other and also allowing uh, the hosts like plants or animals or humans uh, to thrive in this planet, in our planet. And uh, the, the, the microbes, they are, 
very it's a very uh, huge uh, the diverse of the microbes and we we don't know yet the extension of this micro uh, the, the the biodiverse of uh, microbes but I can tell you uh, the last global estimates uh, of our planet's biodiversity uh, there are some I mean of course those numbers can change they are always changing but the last uh, global estimates. Uh, um, we can say that we have uh, around five to seven point seven million unique animal species. So let's say five to seven or seven million species of animals. More than a five hundred thousand uh, species of plants, and six to eight million uh, species of uh, fungi. Fungi, and. The less estimates uh, would say that we have up to one trillion species of uh, prokaryotes, so uh, bacteria and archaea. You know, so it, it's really diverse and it's really huge. I mean, imagine one trillion, maybe probably one or more uh, than a, one trillion species living and thriving our planet. So that's. Uh, Still, a, a lot of research that we need to, to you know, to to pursue to to have, uh, you know, the real uh, picture of this uh, huge diversity. Um, they, and, and, and they are super pretty small, but they uh, can uh, wait a lot because uh, the, the the our planet's biomass, the microbes, represent. 50 to 60 percent of the biomass. So if you uh, you know. If you wait, the whales, elephants, the whole human population, um, our animals and chickens and, and so on in one side, and you try to put the microbes in the other side, I mean, the bacteria, the fungi, um, and the archaea, you know, they will uh, be at least the same or maybe even, you know, heavier than, uh, than, 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 than the, the big uh, beans. So we still have a long way to go. A lot of things that we need to learn and uh, to try to understand the microbial life. And uh, when we, and I'm talking about this huge diversity of species in our planet. And the soil, the soil is more, the most diverse ecosystem. Uh, we have the oceans, we have, uh, you know, um, um, the ice, we have um, hydrothermal vents, we have several extreme environments, we have several environments on our planet. But when we go to soil, the soil, uh, it's, it's amazing and it's a very special uh, ecosystem, the soil that we have in our planet, because they're extremely diverse and most of the diversity that we have in our planet, actually, they come from soil. And it's a very complex environment. It's a very complex uh, uh, because you have a lot of factors uh, interacting in the soil ecosystem. You have uh, the abiotic factors, of course, and pH and, uh, and the size of, uh, you know, the, the, the pores and uh, the water content, um, content of heavy metals, humic acids. So you have a lot of factors, chemical and physical factors. And we also have very strong and dynamic uh, uh, interactions uh, uh, occurring between and among those microbes and those microbes in the host, like plants or soil animals as well. So it's a very complex, a very dynamic ecosystem. So it's a very challenging to work with soil. And it's amazing. Uh, this is just a marketing, a propaganda of... Uh, my book, and I, I, I was one of the editors of this. Uh, we launched this, uh, launched this book uh, in 2019, and this uh, it was a, a collaboration, amazing collaboration actually with uh, Dick Van Elsas from the uh, Netherlands. Actually, Dick Van Elsas was my uh, former supervisor during my PhD thesis, so it, it was a very special moment of my career. Um, uh, to be editing a book, a very important book, The Modern Soil Microbiology, um, together with Jake Van Elsus. Uh, Van Elsus is a, it's a very uh, good friend uh, until nowadays. And also uh, Professor Jack Travers, a Canadian, uh, uh, very uh, um, known uh, professor in soil science. He's an expert in, um, in bioremediation and in contamination, soil contamination. 
uh, and myself, and uh, Professor Paolo Nanipieri from Italy. There is also a very well-known uh, soil scientist. He is working on uh, different aspects of uh, especially uh, nitrogen fixation and soil biochemistry. And uh, it was a very good experience. So I've been working uh, on soil uh, for a while now. So my thesis actually was on molecular microbial ecology. And I, I, I was, you know, the beginning of my uh, um, passion uh, for the microbiology and the microbes uh, was in a soil. And uh, during uh, my work and my research and my, my times as a, a faculty, a professor in, 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 in the beginning in Brazil after uh, days uh, for a while away in US and now since uh, three years ago in, in Saudi Arabia, I've been also uh, working on uh, extreme soils. And that's a huge passion that I have because we have, uh, I mean, uh, the, the first ex my, my first experience with extreme soil was in Antarctica and it's a very extreme uh, ecosystem. So it's a very, you have soils there and the soil are quite extreme. You have the, the, the low temperature, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the exposure to radiation, to radiation is higher than in other places. So it's a very extreme environment. And so I, I, I start to dig a little bit deeper into these uh, extreme soils from different, uh, actually not only Antarctica, but some other extreme environments. And become also a kind of you know parallel passion that I have in my in my lab in my group. So I have uh, I've, I've been conducting and uh, doing research on extreme soil stuff, trying to understand the 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 the, the role of uh, those uh, extreme microbes that are thriving on those very extreme environments, and how uh, can we. Um, try to understand and how can we try to leverage the power of those of such microbes, extreme microbes from extreme soils in several different biotech applications, including plant growth promotion or you know uh, applications uh, like industrial applications in cosmetic industry or uh, like to produce uh, new uh, sunscreens or you know the, the power of those microbes are amazing and now we also studying some microbes that can uh, in very uh, thermophilic conditions so in hot conditions they can try or they can uh, start the process to degrade microplastic as well so you know we are trying to leverage the power of those microbes for, for different applications and uh, this is the question, I mean, what is extreme? You know, we always uh, think about an extreme environment when uh, in our human perspective. So what is not so good for us is considered a, 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 an, as an extreme environment. But for microbes, there is no such thing. Uh, I mentioned this in the last seminar, but it's good to stress this point, we still, don't know, I mean, the limits of life in our planet. So for the high temperature, um, we have thermophilic, is, thermophilic microbes and hyperthermophilic microbes. And they can thrive in temperatures like uh, 121 degrees Celsius. So this is the, the, the record that we have nowadays. But the scientists, they, they, they believe, the experts in thermophilic microbes, they believe uh, there is still a uh, um, you know that should be microbes actually thrive in even higher temperatures. So um, thermodynamically is is possible. So why not? Uh, low temperature. Um, there are microbes um, uh, thriving. I mean, not only surviving. I mean, thriving. They need. They are happy uh, when uh, we have um, like uh, minus twenty degrees Celsius. So in Antarctica, we have uh, some bacteria uh, um, uh, and, and also some uh, yeasts and fungi actually working metabolically active at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So this is, wow. Uh, usually we uh, use this temperature in the fridge, uh, you know, to frozen our samples. But uh, for such special microbes, the cyclophilic, this is uh, it's it's a paradise. I mean, it's it's super uh, cozy environment, and so on. We have microbes that can thrive in a very uh, or resist in a huge doses of radiation, um, high pressure, 
um, microbes that can thrive and survive in, in deserts so uh, they can cope with uh, um, very extreme drought conditions. So they are very interesting uh, uh, group of microbes, the extremophiles. And they have a huge potential for uh, several uh, uh, biotech applications, as I mentioned before. And one interesting thing is that it doesn't need to be a soil or a hydrothermal vent or a hot spring or Antarctica to be considered a stream, an extreme environment. Inside our body, we have some particular extreme environments in some different places, like uh, our stomach. It's a really low pH environment. And this is actually quite funny because I have uh, colleagues in, uh, I have a, a, a colleague in US and actually he's, uh, he's an expert in astrobiology. So he's studying, you know, extreme microbes and how uh, the life uh, could evolve on our planet and maybe how could be life on Mars surface or some other extreme planets or moons. And he's not uh, isolating microbes from uh, hydrothermal vents or hot springs or uh, deserts or something like that. He's actually studying microbes on our own body and try to understand you know, these uh, connections with extreme environments. That's so interesting. I mean, extreme is everywhere. And the microbes, they are here since the beginning. I mentioned this before. Um, they are very important players in our planet, especially now that we are going towards the sustainability that we need to cope with climate change. We need to cope with all those changes that, that we are facing nowadays. And the microbes, they can uh, they, they regulate the major biogeochemical cycles on our planet, on Earth. And uh, they are so important, the microbes, that uh, even space agents like NASA, the Chinese program uh, in India now, and uh, here in the Middle East, uh, the South, uh, there, there is now, uh, we have now the Saudi Space Agency, we have the Emirates also investing heavily in uh, space um, research. And the microbes, the extreme microbes, they, 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 they can be used as uh, uh, like uh, the production of, uh, uh, because they have the biogeochemical activity here in the extreme environments. And their efforts to discover life on other planets or moons. And so they maybe can provide the biosignatures, you know, that we can try to search uh, and NASA is trying to do this, uh, the Chinese program, astrobiology program is the same, now India as well, you know, so they, they are very interesting, very interesting. And by regulating uh, global uh, nutrient cycles and greenhouse gas exchange and uh, also disease transmission and protection, um, the microbiome and the microbes on our planet provide a kind of essential life support system um, you know, that actually uh, uh, permit our existence in our planet. So they are extremely important. We cannot think about one planet without the microbes because they play the major and the most important um, uh, biogeochemical cycles in our planet. And uh, I, I, I must say that a functioning Earth without a functioning microbiome is something that we cannot imagine. I mean, it's unimaginable, it's impossible. And uh, so we must include the microbes and the microbiome into the equation of uh, towards a global sustainability. So this is a period, this is super important. And I always like to stress this point. And those extreme microbes, they have, uh, I mentioned a lot of uh, very important may uh, potential uh, applications in several different different um, fields including uh, agriculture and soil as i mentioned is a very complex uh, environment you have chemical physical and also biological factors in constant interaction so it's a very very uh, dynamic system and it's a very complex, it's very difficult actually to study uh, soil uh, diversity, especially when we focus on, on, on microbes. Uh, and we can uh, try to understand the complexity of soil, um, targeting um, microbes uh, and isolation and cultivation in the lab, 
But nowadays we have the metagenomic tools that I mentioned in the first seminar and you know well. Uh, so now we can target the genomes of those microbes that are thriving and living in soil samples and in soil environments, including the extreme soils. So now we can have more information. We can shed a light uh, um, into this, uh, you know, uh, dark box, this black box that is soil. And even more, with all the bioinformatic tools that we have nowadays, so we have the multi-omic tools, so we have the omics, we have genomics, we have uh, metagenomics, we have uh, proteomics and metaproteomics, we have metabolomics, and you know, in the metabolomics you can use in isolates, or you can also target now metabolites in the ecosystem, so we can extract those metabolites and try to uh to have a, a biological information from that and this is quite challenging i know and it's uh, difficult but now we have tools that we didn't have uh like few years ago so we have very special tools that we can now start really dig deeper literally into soil ecosystem and uh on top of the multi-omics approaches that we have nowadays the tools that we have we also have a huge uh, number of bioinformatic tools uh, that, you know, that uh, we have uh, actually every day there is a new uh, uh, software, a new algorithm, a new pipeline, and so, so on. So we can now really start to dig deeper into those um, big data that we are generating using uh, next generation sequencing or um, extracting metabolomics or metabolites from soil samples or, you know, some different environments. And now we can try to put some order into this uh, huge uh, framework of uh, this uh, 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 amount of information that we have nowadays. So we can try to organize this information, use the pipelines and bioinformatic tools that is also uh, improving every day, daily. And we can now try to understand the you know, metabolic network or the, the, the interactions between and among those microbes and also those microbes and uh, the hosts, including the plants that can thrive in, on different ecosystems and soil systems. We can also understand now uh, the function of those uh, microbes and the interactions uh, between microbes and between microbes and the plants, among microbes and plants. And uh, so, so it's a very interesting moment. Again, it's always good to stress that it's not simple because when I'm here talking about, you know, all those multiomics uh, and now bioinformatic tools, uh, you may say, well, okay, so that's easier. No, it's not easier. I mean, it's extremely challenging. Uh, soil is super challenging ecosystem. And when you uh, think about extreme soil is even more complex. It's a super uh, extreme environment. And uh, you can have a low biomass, so the, the number of microbes are not so high. And, uh, and this will cause uh, troubles when we think about the DNA extraction to perform metagenomic uh, uh, studies. So, you know, so it's more complex. You have, you add layers of complexity and, 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 and difficulties uh, when you go uh, from a soil that is difficult to an extreme soil. But in soil ecosystem, you have environmental factors, as I mentioned before, uh, biotic and abiotic. So you have the plant, you have the, the microbes, especially the rhizobacteria, that I, is the target of my talk today. And uh, you have pat pathogens as well in soil. And so this is a really, you know, uh, it's like a movie. They always uh, play in different roles, roles in this uh, uh, system. And sometimes we uh, have a good microbe winning <laughs> the prize. But sometimes if you have, uh, you know, uh, imbalance in this system, you, you can have the pathogens uh, being the, the winners in this system. So this is a very tricky environment. So this is why I, it's so important to have uh, those molecular tools uh, to, to try to shed light on, on, on the interaction. So we can really try to understand more and more. Uh, I like this uh, the, the concept of rhizosphere. Rhizosphere is a very important hotspot of uh, diversity and also uh, actually in a function. Uh, when I think about metabolically uh, active microbes, we go to the rhizosphere that is a hotspot. 
And uh, the first definition of rhizosphere, I think you know super well, uh, was proposed by Hutner in, uh, in 1904. And actually in that time, he didn't know about the microbes that we have in soil, only the rhizobia and the nodules that they can be, they can be formed in, with soybean and rhizobium microbes. And so this was what they named it, um, or termed it as a rhizosphere in that time. Nowadays, especially nowadays, I mean, with all the multiomics, all the tools that we have, we know that we know nothing. There's still a long way to go. We are still, you know, in the beginning, still, uh, as I mentioned before, scratching the surface of the potential of microbes. So this is a very important uh, definition. Um, you have the root system and uh, in this, uh, there are several different definitions, but I like this one. Uh, that we can consider the rhizosphere, this uh, soil uh, layer that is really, you know, intimately and closely at attached, attached to the, the, the root system. And it's a very uh, dynamic uh, ecosystem as well. It's a very diverse, as a, uh, there are a lot of interactions and uh, activity because the plants are actually exudating um, sugars uh, carbohydrates uh, that will feed the microbes. And the microbes will give uh, nitrogen for the plants or uh, will help solubilization of phosphate or some microbes will, uh, uh, yeah, perform nitrogen fixation. Some microbes will um, um, uh, produce uh, substances like uh, similar to phytohormones like indole acetic acid, and this will also helps to promote the growth of the plants, the, 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 the root system. So that's a very uh, interesting and uh, complex environment. I would like to refer to this uh, paper, this article by Triveg et al, uh, published in, uh, it's a review in Nature Reviews and Microbiology, in Microbiology in 2020. And it's super uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, if you guys, especially these students, if you are, if you have curiosity to know a little bit more about the the the, the mechanisms, uh, now uh, uh, you know uh, that we can tell nowadays using the multiomics and including more microbes in this uh, framework. You know, because now we have metagenomic data, we have uh, culturomics that we can isolate more microbes than ever. So we have a lot of information now. And so this is also changing a little bit the, the way that we uh, can see, you know, the microbiome assemblage in this, uh, in, in the plant ecosystem. So this is a very interesting, uh, the, the first picture is uh, interesting. We can see the filter factor, like we have a huge diverse of microbes in soil and there is a filtering system. So the rhizosphere, the plant is actually selecting some particular groups of microbes, especially the good microbes that will benefit the plant. Sometimes you have some issues in the soil system. And so you can have more pathogens coming to the system, but I mean, this is another situation. And uh, there are some microbes that actually can uh, penetrate the plants and can live inside the, 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 the plant system. So this is what uh, we call the, the endophytes. So they are less diverse. They are more, you know, a, a selected group of microbes. And we also have a different uh, compartment that is the phylosphere. So the microbes that can live on the leaf uh, uh, layer of the plant. And they are totally different. Or made, uh, the majority of those microbes are different from the microbes that we have on soil because they came from air, from dusty, from, uh, you know, different situations on different uh, environments. And that's interesting because so now we can try to understand a little bit more about those different microbial groups and how they can uh, communicate with the plant and how the plant is actually selecting or inducing a process like a biofilm formation that will lead a better, you know, capacity of colonization of uh, such microbes and the plant system. And uh, some microbes also are able to uh, colonize the inside plant, the interior of the plants, and so become the endophytes. And now we have uh, more tools, uh, as I mentioned before, the omics, especially the metabolomics is the next frontier 
now the, uh, actually allowing uh, you know uh, trying to connect the dots and now we can try to understand how the microbes are communicating with each other and how the microbes also communicate with the plant host you know so there are a lot of uh, chemical compounds between them you know and uh, this is actually the way that they com communicate again it's not simple as i am um, trying to explain or talk about it's very complex it's super difficult uh, we need to improve the, the, the analytical tools and we need to improve the bioinformatics as well. But as I can say now, we are in the next level, you know, um, to understand the, the potential of those uh, interactions. We are still, now we are, I can say that we are really learning how the, those interactions uh, are being uh, shaped and how plants can shape the microbiome and the microbes in the soil system and in the rhizosphere system, ecosystem. So it's really, really a good moment to be a plant scientist or, or a soil microbiologist or, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a future for the students, a future scientist working in this uh, particular field. It's a very good moment because now we have tools that I didn't have in uh, when I was a, you know, PhD student. And uh, it's really amazing to be alive in this uh, time now and uh, to see all those changes. And this is really um, uh, actually challenging to, to, to cope and to maintain the pace with those uh, changes that we have nowadays every day. And so the rhizobacteria, they are able to colonize and to persist in the, in the, the root system. And these organisms, uh, they may establish maybe in neutral, uh, so they will do nothing uh, there, or they will just live there, or stay there. But sometimes they, there are some microbes that can cause uh, problems, disease, and they can be a deleterious or negative interaction. And some microbes actually are symbionts and symbionts, and they can uh, lead to positive interactions in, in, you know, in this uh, relation uh, to plant development. Uh, several experiments have already shown that specific, uh, specific bacterial strains, uh, when inoculated in seeds, colonize the roots and increase plant growth. So this is well known for, for a while. And we have, we've been using those microbes for uh, improve uh, agriculture, plant production uh, uh, for a long time now. Uh, and actually, just a curiosity, Cooper and Schrott in 78, 1978, were the first uh, to introduce the term uh, rhizobacteria promoting, you know, plant growth. So PGPR that we, we say nowadays, we call nowadays. So this is not so new, uh, you know, uh, uh, term. And again, uh, those microbes that can perform biological nitrogen fixation. Sometimes they can produce antimicrobial substances. So we'll uh, block the, the, the action of potential pathogens so they can protect the plants. Uh, we, they can also protect the plants against pathogens uh, by niche competition, exclusion. Uh, some microbes can produce uh, fit hormones or similar to plant hormones. So also stimulating the plant growth. And uh, sometimes they can produce, uh, they can solubilize phosphate. And this will also help the plant. I mean, so they can play several different uh, roles uh, to help the plants. Those are some groups of microbes, uh, especially bacteria, that are well known as a PGPRs. So Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas, Azospirillum, Bacillus, Penibacillus, uh, Bucholderia, Azotobacter, Herbaspirillum, Glucanacetobacter, Azoarchus. I can add a lot of microbes uh, in this list, like rhizobiums and, uh, you know, so on. So we know a lot of uh, very good microbes and they've been helping us in biological control or in as a biofertilizers for decades now with amazing, amazing outcomes, amazing uh, help in the production. Yeah, some rhizobiasia. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the biological control, uh, several microbes are extremely important um, and to help, you know, uh, to control uh, some uh, pathogens, bacteria or fungi that uh, without the help of those, uh, you know, superheroes, uh, they will cause uh, diseases and, uh, you know, can be a disaster. 
And uh, to be a PGPR, they, I, I mentioned some features. Uh, so the production of seed aerophores are one of the very important um, features, characteristics of one PGPR. Uh, so they can uh, produce the air force and these uh, can chelate, can uh, capture iron or you know nutrients uh, that are needed by the microbes and it can help the plant growth. So just keep this in mind. I, I know you know this, but I'm stressing this for one reason. Um, and two factors that are considered extremely important for a good biological control agent and uh, to control agricultural pests. I, I mean, first, it must have a pathogen inhibition mechanism. So to be a good uh, agent of biological control. And one very important thing, it should be, the microbe should be able to colonize the plant rhizosphere, which will make the beneficial bacteria uh, in the right place at the right time. So this is also a very important aspect. So sometimes you have in the lab a very important, uh, powerful strain producing a lot of antibiotics or a lot of antimicrobial substances. But when you go to the greenhouse, that particular strain is not a good colonizer. You know, it's not good fit. So this happens uh, actually always. <laughs> it's very common in the lab. It's frustrating uh, for it sometimes, but I mean, it's, it's, it's how it is. So it's, uh, the, you know, the good combination. Uh, I mean, you have uh, not only the, the features, the, the potential features to be a PGPR, but also must be a good colonizer. Um, and one of the important features, uh, again, uh, the phosphate sol solubilization. I mentioned this before. It's a very important, uh, interesting uh, um, characteristic uh, for a microbe to be considered a PGPR plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, uh, especially in some particular soil ecosystems that we have uh, the phosphate is a very, can be a very strong limiting um, uh, nutrient. And so those microbes will help the plants to cope with this uh, issue, the problem. So, uh, uh, and I mentioned before, and the, I will stress again here, uh, the production of plant hormones. So the production of plant or uh, plant growth promoting substances like uh, auxin, acetic indol, acetic gibberellins, cytokinins. So there are several microbes that can produce uh, those uh, compounds. And this will, of course, help the plant. And this is also very important characteristic of, uh, characteristic of uh, a good microbe, you know, for, for um to be used as a PGPR. Uh, but what affects the most? What is the most important factor, the soil or the rhizosphere? I mean, there is no answer, simple answer for this question. Um, some authors suggest that soil type and the conditions have a greater effect on the microbial community than the rhizosphere effect. So there's still a school or some scientists that believe uh, the, uh, suggest that the soil type is the most important factor. Uh, and that maybe that's the case. I mean, the soil affects the community, the microbial community that is actually modulated by the rhizosphere. And so this is, you know, the tenants now. And I refer again to that paper that I mentioned before from 2020, uh, that, that review in Nature Reviews uh, Microbiology. Uh, you know, combining several different uh, new publications or recent publications, talking about the microbial diversity, and, and especially now that we have the multiomics and also the metabolomics. So we can say that actually maybe the soil actually is affecting the microbial community, but uh, the rhizosphere, the plant, will modulate, you know, this microbial community. We'll select some particular groups of uh, microbes. And I, 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 I want to give you a few examples, and I want to invite you uh, to think outside the box for a while now. We can talk about the application of those extreme microbes in uh, agriculture, and I will go there. But I want to uh, uh, um, show you guys a case study that we applied in a mangrove uh, plants, a mangrove ecosystem, 
but using the same principles, uh, inoculation of with good microbes and uh, good PGPR microbes, and also combination with some other microbes, a consortium, and how we got some very interesting uh, results. I, 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 the first seminar, I just showed one or two slides, but now I will go a little bit deeper into this um, application. So uh, this is a very interesting case, uh, the mangroves. They are super important ecosystem uh, ecosystems. They, they, um, they can actually fix carbon or, you know, uh, in a more efficient way uh, than uh, forests like the rainforest, the Amazon forest in Brazil. It's a very powerful ecosystem. But when you go to the mangroves, they can actually fix uh, carbon. That means that they can retain carbon in a, uh, uh, in a more efficient way than um, the rainforests. And uh, you are lucky because Indonesia has uh, the you know biggest extension of mangroves uh, around the world. So you have a lot of very important ecosystems that the mangroves. Um, they are very important for tourism, for food production. 30 to 50% of mangrove forests have been uh, lost in the last uh, decades. So it's a very uh, threatened environment. It's a very important because protect the coast, uh, prevent erosion, stabilize shorelines, also uh, reduce uh, uh, the, the, the impact of storms. So protect our coast is a nursery for shrimps, uh, fish species, um, other animals, crabs. And uh, so it's a very important ecosystem, but we are, running against the time because they they you know we've been destroying our mangroves in a very accelerated rate so we must deal with that and on top of those uh, you know uh, destructions and deforestation we can add uh, also um, contamination and uh, well, for instance the, the the it's a very common place to have uh, oil spills you know and why is that? Uh, most of uh, the, the 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 vessels, the the, the, the ships, and uh, transporting uh, not only oil but any cargo, they go in the harbors, the ports, the harbors. Uh, they usually are located in in you know in regions uh, with mangroves, and uh, so you have a very explosive combination. You have a very intense um, um traffic of uh, ships and vessels uh, and you have also a very sensitive ecosystem a very important ecosystem the mangroves and sometimes you have uh, problems uh, with spill and the mangroves are so important that we uh, built a, a global research network that we call mangrove microbiome initiative uh, and the idea is to catalyze rapid development on, uh, of uh, microbiome environmental applications and try to understand more, you know, and better the, the diversity of mangrove plants and the mangrove uh, microbiome um, uh, compound into this equation. So this is a mangrove microbiome initiative. We, uh, we launched this in 2019, officially with this uh, publication in M Systems. Uh, the MMI, Mangrove Microbiome Initiative, is uh, I'm leading this uh, together with uh, Jack Gilbert from UCSD San Diego, and we have some other colleagues from CAUS and uh, uh, US, and now it's a global network, as I mentioned before, so we have people from um, um, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, um, Europe, uh, Brazil, Panama, you know, it's a worldwide uh, initiative. I think we need some people from um, Indonesia. This would be amazing to have experts in mangrove ecosystem, especially interested in, in the mangrove, in the, in the mangrove microbiome. And uh, it's an ongoing project. We have, uh, you know, uh, virtual meetings and we are planning an uh, in-person uh, meeting um, next year. And if you have uh, curiosity, just try to. We have a new website now for this initiative, but it's still uh, it's still uh, in the final uh, no uh, touch. So we need to polish a little bit more. But should be launched the, the new website pretty soon, maybe next week or so. 
But if you want, if you try, uh, if you are curious, you can assess this uh, link, uh, BMMO microbe net. And uh, there are some information there and how uh, can you join you know, the, the, this uh, initiative. And we exchange protocols. We are planning to apply uh, for uh, grants together. Um, we are working on publications, uh, you know, so it's a very interesting forum to discuss the importance of uh, the microbes that are thriving in any mangrove. And we, um, this publication, this uh, paper from 2020, we uh, point out several potential applications of the microbes and the microbiome to help uh, uh, the function of mangroves and how can, they can be uh, important players in this ecosystem. And for that, I will mention this application um, that we, uh, uh, it's a case study. Uh, there was a mangrove uh, in Brazil and this mangrove was a beautiful mangrove and it was a, a really close to a oil uh, refinery. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's a very sensitive ecosystem. And sometimes, and most of the times, actually, we have harbors or we have refineries or some, you know, industry really near or inside the mangrove ecosystem. And uh, so there was a huge oil spill. And uh, the oil was spilled in this mangrove and destroyed everything. So it, it, it was a red and extreme environment because it was, uh, you, you have the salinity, especially in, in uh, this particular mangrove exists in a, in a very, uh, in the Northeast part of Brazil. So you have more, you know, uh, uh, the salinity is higher than in, in some other mangroves. So you have a lot of uh, the, the problem of salinity and we also had the excess of oil, the solvents. So it's a very extremely complex environment in that time. And uh, the mortality rate of the plants, uh, the mangrove trees uh, was, was devastating. It was, it was super sad to see that. And of course, uh, the oil company, they were trying to uh, recover that mangrove for a while. And so they were trying to revegetate, to perform the reforestation of that mangrove. But the mortality uh, rate was something like 95%. So 95%. So the plants couldn't cope with this, uh, you know, huge amount of uh, solvent, huge amount of oil. So it was pretty sad uh, situation. And uh, we decided to, uh, to apply by remediation. And our idea was uh, to combine in one uh, a consortium of microbes, uh, some microbes, remember the oil is, is not a simple thing. Also, it's a very complex uh, compost. It's a, we have several different fractions, you know, composing the oil. And uh, we have microbes, uh, bacteria, sometimes fungi, that are able to degrade different fractions of the oil, you know, uh, compounds. So we combine some microbes that are able to, to degrade different fractions of oil. Plus microbes with those, you know, characteristics that I, I, I listed before, you know, to, to, to be named to be uh, known as a PGPR microbes. So we selected from the mangrove trees, microbes, bacteria, and now we also have fungi, but that were able to produce uh, phytormones or to fix nitrogen or, um, to uh, uh, good colonizers, I mentioned this before. So it must be a very important microbe, but also should be a very good root, root uh, colonizer. So it should colonize the root system. And uh, uh, we combine those microbes into one uh, powerful consortium of microbe. And uh, in the mangrove, we have the tidal problem. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the waves come and go, and this could wash our consortium away. So the idea here was to encapsulate those uh, microbes. And uh, for that, we used a polymer. So we encapsulated this, uh, the consortium using uh, slow release polymer, uh, similar uh, those polymers that we can use in agriculture. So we have a slow release uh, 
um, fertilizers, so chemical fertilizers that we um, you know on soil. And it's a pretty similar polymer here. So we uh, encapsulate the microbes and uh, we tested uh, the shelf life of those microbes and we, uh, we proved that they could be alive at least six months uh, inside these, uh, you know, uh, polymers. And uh, the polymers also uh, help the problem tidal because when the, the wave and the tidal come, the polymer, you know, uh, has, has this uh, um, swallow the, 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 the water and it starts a slow release of the microbes. And when the tidal uh, goes away, went away, um, the polymer shrink protecting the microbes against uh, radiation, the solar radiation, the, you know, the, the heat. Remember, I'm talking about a tropical region and it's in the north part of Brazil. So it's very hot there. And uh, so it was a very good combination. So we prepared this in the lab. We went to the field, we applied this in the rhizosphere, those plants. And after that, uh, we went to the um, field. And we applied those microbes uh, in combination with the plants, the mangrove trees, in the, into site, into uh, in the heavily contaminated mangrove. So we start our own uh, revegetation, reforestation uh, project. But now, not only using the plants, again, using plants plus the good microbes, the PGPR, plus the microbes uh, able to degrade the oil. So it was a very good combination. And nowadays we have more microbes uh, and more possibilities because now we are also adding and uh, constructing consourcing of uh, microbes uh, able to uh, degrade oil in uh, anaerobic condition that is the dominant condition in mangroves, and also uh, including fungi in the in the consortium. So we really, you know, give more power to the the the. the to the PGPR or to the consortium that we are using. We tested the effects of this consortium using several different uh, parameters. So that's what we call multi-parametric monitoring. So uh, plant development, uh, um, oil degradation because it's a oil contaminated mangrove, microbial community, the profile of microbial community. So, you know, so we have a multi-parametric monitoring uh, panel so we can know and we can check everything during the process. And I think this picture is the best uh, example. So we can see before and we can see after the, the our bioremediation, including plant growth promoting rhizobacteria in the consortium. So it's 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 a visual. One important thing here: uh, if you have an oil spill in a mangrove ecosystem, and if you leave the oil there, you do nothing. If you do nothing there, you're not spill again, of course, uh, but the oil, uh, the mangrove will take 20 to 25 years to recover from that spill. So it's a really long time process. But using the extreme microbes, using the powerful plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, you know, those microbes that we selected, plus the microbes that were able to degrade the oil fractions in this uh, particular uh, uh, contaminated ecosystem, uh, we were able to uh, recover the mangrove in 10% of this time. So it's not 25 or 30 years, 20 to 30 years. We were able to, to recover the mangrove in two years and a half. So it was a really game changer in that time. So we have a patent on this process. We have uh, several publications. There are still several publications uh, coming with, uh, with this approach. So it was a very successful application of uh, you know the extreme microbes to help one very important ecosystem. We are now here in Saudi Arabia applying the same uh, uh, principle. We have a project now uh, trying to accelerate the plant growth of uh, my, my, uh, the mangroves here. Uh, testing probiotics or testing the good microbes, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Um, here we are not in Saudi Arabia, we are not targeting uh, for now. We have also the potential to do this, but I mean, uh, but we are not focusing on the oil spill um, because most of the, the spills uh, that they have here are in the desert regions, not really in the mangrove regions. 
but uh, there there is a huge uh, program now in Saudi Arabia that is uh, aligned with the Saudi Green Initiative. And they are actually uh, red planting thousands of mangrove trees, try to recover and actually to increase in 30% the mangrove ecosystems here in Saudi Arabia, not only in the Arabic Gulf, but in the Red Sea region as well. And uh, so we are testing ways uh, to accelerate the process. And uh, remember, um, this is also interesting. The mangroves here in Saudi Arabia, especially in the Red Sea region, they are very extreme mangroves. They are not like the mangroves in Indonesia or India or in Brazil, in Brazil, that we have a lot of, uh, you know, um, rivers and we have uh, a port of nutrients. And, you know, it's a very rich environment in here. Uh, especially in Saudi Arabia, they don't have um, um, rivers, you know, and so the mangroves are actually growing and thriving in a very extreme environment. Uh, the salinity is super high, uh, the radiation level, because you have a lot of sunlight, you know, directly in the mangroves, are extremely high, but still you have very interesting and beautiful mangroves, unique mangroves uh, thrive in those environments. So we are trying to understand the, the interactions between those mangrove trees and microbes and how can we leverage the power of those microbes to be used as a probiotic, so to increase the plant growth. So we are studying the mangroves from the Northern region in Saudi Arabia. So those are actually the most extreme mangroves that we have here in Saudi Arabia. Amazing, beautiful region but uh, uh, very extreme when you think about salinity and temperature and uh, you know these uh, situations, conditions. Um, we are studying the, the reservoir of Vicenia Marina and we have a lot of lab work selecting strains, select isolating microbes and uh, um, studying those microbes, sequence their genomes and try to understand the, the you know the molecular potential of those microbes, and after that, applying those microbes in the in the field trials, uh, trials in the in uh, in the greenhouse. And uh, I mentioned before, and so it's the same here. You know, it's not a crop plant that we are using the PGPR approach, but it's the same principle. So the microbes that will act as a PGPR, they must uh, fix nitrogen. Uh, they can uh, solubilize phosphate, they can produce phytohormones, or they can produce cytherophores. And with that, they will help the plants uh, to grow better. So it's the same thing. So this is not maize or, uh, or corn or, or wheat or, you know, the crop plants that we usually uh, apply the PGPR principle. But the principle is the same. And the tests that we select in the lab are exactly the same. But here, our goal is uh, the mangroves. So we have a consortia composed by some microbes, uh, well-known, some pseudomonas, but some microbes not, a well, not so well-known as a PGPR, but they have uh, uh, they present a very good results in the lab. And uh, it's, uh, be, now we are testing this uh, to uh, increase, uh, try to increase the plant growth in, uh, it's in field plots, but uh, using, um, salinity so we have uh, uh, the, the water for irrigation it's a salty water actually like they have in the mangroves uh, ecosystem so we are applied our consortia we are testing this now we are measuring several different parameters to see uh, and i hope we have a success we this is still ongoing um, experiment now uh, i can tell you i don't think uh, yeah those are the, the responsible for the experiment <laughs> I can tell you that we have uh, some very interesting preliminary results. Seems that the probiotics are actually helping the plants to grow better, healthier, and faster. And so this is very, very interesting. So now we need to measure the potential of, uh, you know, uh, scale up these because they are working well in, a, in this system. But when I think about these huge mangroves, uh, we need to, to, you know, to figure out ways uh, to scale up this, uh, the application of those good microbes, those probiotics for mangroves. So here I have Sula, Philip, Hamad, and Hanin. Those are the main uh, responsible for those uh, mangrove applications. Another challenge that we are facing now is, um, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the growing of population, global population. So our planet is growing now. We 
we now have more than eight billion people living on our planet, and uh, there are some uh, uh, like uh, we know that we uh, will need to increase food production by sixty uh, percent uh, by two thousand fifty to feed out this uh, uh, population. We uh, also have uh, increased the water demand to 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 plant. I know uh, to have more crop production, and uh, and this is really challenging because at the same time we are facing those uh, changes uh, in uh, rising temperatures, do we climate change? So it's a really challenging uh, moment that we have now. We have some um, uh, arid regions in our planet. And we can learn a lot um, searching the microbes, you know, uh, that thrive and live in those regions because they can be very powerful uh, allies when we think about uh, sustainable agriculture. And I also recommend you guys uh, this uh, publication, uh, published in Frontiers Microbiology, um, Desert Microbes for Boosting Sustainable Agriculture in Extreme Environments. And actually those extreme environments are becoming more and more common because as I mentioned before, we have a huge process of desertification in different regions, including Brazil. There is a tropical uh, country, but we have in the northeast part of Brazil, uh, a strong ongoing process of desertification. In, in, uh, it's still small when you compare to uh, Saudi Arabia or Sahara region or Australia, but it's quite, quite uh, you know, it, you should pay attention on this. And this paper is quite interesting. It's a review, we have perspective, and uh, it's from uh, Al Sharif, Majed, and Heribert. They are from uh, Kaos, my colleagues from Kaos. And uh, on that, you know, searching interesting microbes from extreme soils. We uh, have one very important research line in my lab. There is a, a life frontier. So trying to search new organisms and new and novel metabolisms. So uh, this is quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, again, to try to target uh, those uh, demands that we have nowadays and we uh, will have nowadays. So we have a particular interest in carbon fixation and carbon cycle and also in nitrogen assimilation process. So how can we, because, you know, we know that we have a potential to discover novel uh, and maybe more powerful carbon fixation systems, metabolisms or, or, or pathways. And maybe we can also, uh, there is a, still a potential to discover novel uh, nitrogen assimilation, maybe more powerful uh, mechanisms, uh, especially searching into the, the extremophiles. So we believe in that. Thermodynamically is uh, possible. And I have colleagues uh, showing that, well, maybe this is a good direction. So that, that's what we are doing now. And uh, especially because when I think about the Haber-Bosch process, that's uh, the process the, that we use nowadays to produce chemical fertilizers. It's a very uh, energy consuming process uh, and also produce a lot of uh, you know carbon dioxide that we have in our planet nowadays. So generates three percent of the carbon dioxide. So it's a very you know uh, energy and uh, uh, demanding uh, process. So we, we it's interesting to have uh, maybe uh, alternatives in the future. And so we are searching several different uh, novel microbes, and I came with this uh, very interesting example of uh, novel microbes. Uh, this is, uh, 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 it was a consortium of microbes isolated from uh, um, very, uh, it's a place and they used to burn grass piles in the same place for, for more than 20 years. So it's a very, uh, you have the heat, you have the, the, the you know, the, 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 the extreme conditions in that soil, but there are microbes uh, living and thriving in this particular ecosystem. So we are obtaining this uh, thermophilic consortia. Um, those microbes uh, grow, they can grow up to uh, 65 degrees Celsius. They cannot grow below 40 degrees Celsius. So they are really in real uh, thermophilic microbes. We study, of course, uh, the metagenomic composition of this consortia. We also, uh, and, the, and also the, the potential uh, function uh, of those microbes. And we noticed that there was one particular microbe 
in that consortia that could be very, very interesting based on the metagenomic data. So we try to isolate that particular microbe and we actually rely on the metagenomic data. Remember, metagenomic means that you don't have the isolate. We have, we have only the genetic information obtained from that uh, from a particular environment. But based on that molecular information, we design uh, one approach to try to target that particular interesting microbe. And uh, we were successful. And actually in 2021, uh, we proposed a new family, Carbo Actinosporaceae. It's an actinomycid, but actually it's a new family and it's a new genus of uh, uh, microbe. It's Carbono Actinospora Thermoautotrophica. So it's a whole new family of microbes. Extremely interesting microbe. Uh, here we can see a carboxysome. Uh, so carboxysome uh, or uh, uh, bacterial micro compartments. And uh, in the carboxysome, the bacteria, the microbe can, uh, you know, uh, keep the enzyme responsible for carbon fixation because the enzyme, it's very sensitive to oxygen. So it must be protected into this, uh, you know, shelf, uh, the carboxysome. And we found a very interesting carboxysome, like a structure inside this uh, isolate. Now that now we have a very special microbe. And I can tell you that is super interesting because that carboxysome isolated from this, uh, obtained from this uh, particular microbe, thermophilic microbe, is very similar to carboxysomes that we have on plants and uh, cyanobacteria, especially cyanobacteria in, in, uh, in cyanobacteria. And that's challenging. I mean, it's it was never, I mean, it's the first time that someone described this kind of uh, structure in, in, in actinomycid. And even more interesting, the bacteria contains not one carbon fixation pathway, but three carbon fixation pathways. So this, this is the first time ever in the literature, you know, that someone obtained and isolate one microbe with more than two carbon fixation pathways. Actually, uh, we have no example of uh, microbes with two carbon fixation pathways, isolated microbes, I mean. We know that there is a potential for microbes to have more than one carbon fixation pathways based on metagenomic data. So there are some recent papers, publications, showing that in the deep sea or in some other ecosystems, uh, when uh, we dig into the metagenomic data, we can see some mags, some uh, uh, potential genomes with maybe two carbon fixation pathways. That's beautiful, interesting. So this can have several uh, implications when we try to measure the carbon fixation in global scale. But I mean, we, we have no nothing, uh, no, no microbe in a, in a pure culture to prove that or to show that. But now we have. So this bacteria, we isolated. This is not published yet, but I'm, uh, uh, the paper is under review now. And uh, it's super interesting because our microbe has not only one, not two, but three carbon fixation pathways. And we prove that they are active because we have proteomic data, we have uh, transcriptomic data. So it's super interesting microbe. It can switch and can choose between the carbon fixation pathways. And this can lead actually several uh, interesting applications. And let's uh, change a little bit subject. We are now uh, go to space, so beyond Earth because I'm talking about those microbes that can be very interesting and they have challenging and new novel metabolisms. And we can apply those microbes here. But there's another application, potential application, super interesting. Uh, now we are talking not only about uh, space exploration, but uh, there are serious uh, programs, um, governmental programs, uh, talking about space colonization. So it's not only explore the like space, but also to build colonies, human colonies from space in the future. I don't know when, I don't know if I will see that. <laughs> Maybe you that are younger, will you see that. But this is really uh, interesting. And uh, this is uh, interesting pictures. Uh, the first one is uh, Mars. The second one, 
Saudi Arabia, Tabuk Desert, similar, very similar visually at least. And uh, in 2019, we propose we are we, we publish a perspective paper, uh, inevitable inevitable future space colonization beyond Earth with microbes first, and this is super true. If you wanna think about space colonization, we must include the microbes, you know, into the equation. Period. And we must include the extreme microbes because they actually maybe will help to produce plants on a greenhouse in space in the future. Because so if you were really, I mean, this can be just an interesting exercise, but if you are really planning to colonize the planets, we will need to, uh, to have food. And we will need to have microbes to help the production of the, the, those uh, nutrients, the, 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 the food, food. And even more, we maybe need the extreme microbes. So there are missions now trying to uh, find life, signals on Mars, so the, the Perseverance rove. <clears throat> so it's a big deal nowadays. And we also, call, of course, we are studying the potential of uh, those extreme microbes in help to increase, to improve, uh, you know, the health conditions of uh, soils from other planets or moons. That's super out of the box uh, application of those extreme microbes. But I decided to point out this and to showcase this to you guys, because I think it's quite interesting. And actually it's timely. It's uh, something that is, we are discussing this now in uh, with different uh, agencies in collaboration with different uh, you know uh, research institu institutions. Uh, we don't have uh, the Mars soils on earth, not yet. But we have, and actually, Mars has no soil as we know it. I mean, but because it's, there is no uh, organic matter, so it's not a soil. It, it's more like a regolith, you know. But we, based on uh, uh, the data from previous uh, rovers, a company in the US is uh, uh, selling this Mars simulant uh, regolith. So we are testing some of our extreme microbes isolated from extreme environment from Saudi Arabia into this uh, regolith, in this Mars simulant. And we are trying to see how they can improve um, the soil conditions, you know, and uh, that could be maybe in the future lead to application of this Mars regolith as a substrate for plant growth on, on Mars, for instance, in a, in a human colony on Mars. Uh, we are building now a Mars simulator chamber, so we can not only have the, 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 the Mars regulate, but we can also simulate the Mars uh, condition. But of course, if we are thinking about plant production on Mars or I don't know, some other place, we uh, will need to rely on, on greenhouses, special greenhouses, but we are trying to challenge the best. One good, good, good example that we have a similar approach here on Earth at the desert biocrust. So we have a kind of a skin that protects some regions of the desert regions. And learning and studying the desert biocrust is we can actually learn and, and try to develop some uh, process, uh, biotechnological process that could help, you know, to cope with um, agriculture in desert regions, in arid regions like Saudi Arabia, for instance, but also we can learn how those microbes interact to be, to you know to 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 assemble these uh, like uh, skin uh, to protect the soil. But how can we apply a similar approach uh, on um, Mars regolith, for instance, stuff like that? So it's improving the soil condition. So we are studying this, and uh, we isolate several interesting microbes. This actually is not a bacteria, but we also have bacteria. It's a fungi isolated from uh, Alhaba crater. There is a volcanic crater that we have in Saudi Arabia. It's a very beautiful and amazing environment. It's a very extreme, of course. The volcano is, uh, is still uh, active. We can we consider it still active volcano, and uh, but it has a deep layer of salt. You know, it's so salinity, uh, draw and uh, uh, heat. Uh, it's super hot there, and. Uh, but we have thermophilic microbes thriving in such an environment. And so this uh, fungi was isolated and we tested in the lab. It's a new species uh, fungi 
we are studying uh, the, the it's a genome now, it's a new species. And we are also studying the metabolites that this fungi is, uh, being, uh, is producing when we inoculated the Mars simulant, the Mars regulate with uh, this particular fungi. And we are trying to, to see how can we improve the soil, the regulate quality, you know, that maybe in the future could be used as a substrate for plant growth. And uh, yeah, and the metabolomics uh, shows uh, that, that actually uh, there are some very interesting uh, features. So the, the, this fungi can uh, survive and can thrive in this Mars simulant. And actually is producing several different substances, including siderophores that remember is one of the important characteristics as, uh, for a plant growth promoting microbe. And uh, we are still digging into this uh, more, but it's interesting because it, we can see the potential to use extreme microbes to improve uh, soil conditions, health uh, conditions of soil, the conditioning of soil that can be used actually here. It'd be actually easier on uh, arid ecosystems like uh, soil from Saudi Arabia. But in theory, at least, uh, could be also uh, applied beyond Earth uh, when we think about space um, colonization. Uh, this is the student, Aleph, the PhD student working on this uh, more astrobiology related uh, study. And I'm going to my final slides. So uh, just to finish, I again want to I talk about this uh, publication from Herbert's uh, uh, group. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, perspective paper. And it's the same principle that we apply uh, from those extreme microbes that can be used on maybe uh, Mars colony, colonization for Mars colonization, but they can also maybe be uh, used and applied in an easiest way because we are here on Earth uh, to increase, to improve uh, a sustainable agriculture in uh, extreme environments, in desert uh, regions. And uh, there are several interesting applications and uh, we can see uh, the way that those microbes are helping the plants uh, to cope with uh, like salinity or water stress. That is the main problem here in, the, in these uh, arid regions. So there are several uh, publications and, and actually uh, actual uh, products showing that uh, microbes, bacteria that were isolated from desert or desert plants can be applied with very successful rates to improve you know, crop production uh, with more extreme environments or more arid environments with, um, you know, we have more salinity in the water or the water stress, so we, we can go grow plants with less water than usually plants uh, we will need in some other uh, places. And there are several uh, studies showing the mechanisms and how the, those microbes are helping those plants to cope with stress. And this is another paper from another uh, group of colleagues, uh, also here from Kaus, uh, Mark Tester, Kyle Larson, and uh, Leffers. Uh, also very interesting. So, you know, especially when you think about um, extreme environments or arid environments like Saudi Arabia or Middle East or some other regions, uh, if you combine the power of those good microbes, the good microbiome, plus novel approaches, novel technologies, uh, you have, you know, the sky is really maybe not the limit. We can go even beyond. So that's that's the, the reason. I mean, we can have uh, greenhouses, uh, modern greenhouses in the desert that can be actually um, using uh, solar panels. And uh, so you can have, uh, you know, uh, the temperature can be controlled inside the greenhouse. You know, so there are several technological advancements that will help uh, increase the production of uh, crop production in our planet. And the same approach could be uh, actually adapted and uh, we will need of course a lot of advances but I mean could be used uh, in space exploration and I will finish with uh, yeah some good uh, pictures beautiful pictures from the Saudi um, 
extreme landscapes. So uh, some desert regions and also the Red Sea. That is also a very interesting and extreme environment. And again, this is uh, my website or my group, uh, Twitter and uh, my email. And uh, you'll be more than welcome to uh, answer any question if you have. And thank you again for this uh, opportunity to talk about extreme microbes and the potential of uh, application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Alex, for sharing your insightful knowledge. I now invite uh, our uh, esteemed audience to post any question they may have. Please uh, use the right hand feature or the comment feature within the Zoom application to ask your question. Do we have any question? Please. Any question from the audience? Okay, please, Ali Budi Kusuma, time is yours. Okay. Hello, Alex. Hello. Hey, hello. Hi. Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Ali. I am from United Nations. So I would like to ask a question about, because you were mentioned that uh, you're isolating so many microbial strains from different extreme environments. And then many of them actually showing really good properties for uh, plant growth promoting, as well as to degrade recalcitrant compounds such as hydrocarbons. And I'm just wondering whether or not do we able to actually patenting the microbes or is it only the process that we can patent? That's the first question. The second question is actually when you develop a product from microbial strains that you you got it from nature. A, when you apply this microbes, microbial consortium radar in different environments, so would that be working at the same with producing the same result that you were possibly, for instance, when you apply your consortium in Red Sea and then when you apply in Indonesia or in Thailand, would, would you get the same results? Just wondering that question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Very important questions. Very good questions. Yes, uh, microbes and uh, the products. Yeah, the microbes, it's, uh, this actually depends on the country. So most of the countries in, uh, like Brazil, I think Indonesia should be the same. You, can, you cannot patent uh, the microbes. You can patent the process. Like uh, the example uh, I showed before, uh, that we have a patent for the, 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 the mangrove bioremediation process. The mangrove bioremediation, we patent the process. You know, and, uh, and the consortium that we applied in that time actually was included in the process. So that there was a way to, to patent the, the whole processing uh, process using those uh, microbes, that microbes. But uh, the most of the countries, the majority of countries, they, yeah, you are not allowed to patent a microbe itself. I mean, uh, but the process uh, uh, that goes along with the, the particular microbe. Um, in the second question, I think it's so very important. Um, usually we work with uh, indigenous or autochthonous uh, consources. So, you know, we go to a particular environment, we check the problem, like a doctor checking the, the patient with a disease. So you go there, so we check the, 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 the environment. Well, I can see that this uh, particular ecosystem is uh, with this uh, particular disease, like uh, the oil uh, contamination, oil spill. And so we help and we isolate and we obtain the microbes from the same environment. And what we do in the lab, we grow uh, in a larger number, the microbes, and we can help the process, like in that mangrove um, that we were able to recover uh, with 10% of the time like in two years and a half and not wait 30 years to recover the mangrove. Um, 
we combine the good microbes and we also uh, 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 we select those microbes from the environment and also they, they were from that environment. If we decide to apply the same consource of microbes in a mangrove in Indonesia, I don't think we will work, would work, you know, because in different ecosystems, you have different microbes. And so it's always, you know, the best approach is try to select for especially consource and this kind of application to select microbes from the same local. And this is interesting because we are not uh, using uh, any, uh, you know, genetically modified microbe. That can be a problem and uh, with most of countries' uh, legislations. And so this is a, a big challenge. So we are using microbes from that uh, particular environment. So we just select, we isolate, we process, we increase their numbers of the good microbes in the lab because sometimes they are there. I mean, they are there in the environment, but they are usually sometimes in low number. So it help the ecosystem, you know? And um, this is a very interesting uh, uh, question because I remember when I was working on uh, mangroves in some other soil uh, ecosystems, uh, there was a company and they were buying uh, consources from an um, American company, but trying to apply in a Brazilian region. And they were spending millions of dollars buying a lot of you know products and it was not working, no results. And we had this uh, brainstorm, a discussion and uh, they were not microbiologists, of course, uh, the people from the company, but I said, well, if you follow some um, basic you know, microbial ecology rules, you will understand, I mean, those people. And what I'm super happy to see nowadays is that those microbial ecology concepts or, you know, or, or theories are really uh, be included in the in the equation nowadays. So always when we discuss application of the, such microbes, we think about the potential of that environment. So sometimes we are not working in other environment. It's the same for Antarctica. We develop a system uh, to biomediate Antarctic soils. There's also extreme soil. And of course, uh, especially there, you must have uh, the psychrophilic microbes adapted to the cold region. And uh, it was a very successful uh, uh, case study, example of application. But again, yeah, you must have a, a particular consortium for your particular problem. It's like, and and we, we talk about soil, but also, I must stress here that nowadays, especially with the knowledge that we have now about microbiomes, this is also changing human health. When we talk about human health nowadays, so we, when you go to a medical doctor or something like that, uh, the, the, there is a growing you know, ex exponential movement towards the precision medicine nowadays. You know, because so, you, sometimes you have some products that will help most of population. But the majority of, ca of cases, but you can see, sometimes we are taking a medicine and it's not working, and your your friend is uh, taking the same medicine and it's working well. And nowadays we know that the microbes can process our medicine as well. You know the the the, the pills that you take or something like that in different ways, With different microbes <laughs> change the effects of the the, the, the drugs, the, the the medicine. And so those concepts are actually evolving to different fields and different applications, not only soil, not only agriculture, but also human health. So it's it's quite interesting. Thank okay. Thank you, okay. Alex. Any feedback from Pa Ali Budikusumo? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Alex, for your explanation. I'm just wondering, uh, because we knew that from from the habitats, they, they might have the core microbiomes underlying each of the niche in the environment. Then I was wondering if we collecting some uh, microbial species from different deserts, habitats across the world, and then we try to apply those, the isolating the core microbiome that having a properties as a PGPR and degraders of, of the recalcitrant. I'm just, just wondering whether is it also applicable to develop kind of one fit for all products. This, thank you. Yeah, 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 very good. It's very timely, actually. This is uh, this is true. I mean, we can, and this is actually is one approach. Uh, uh, we are trying to do the same uh, approach, trying to understand the core microbiome of mangroves, 
so I mentioned this mangrove microbiome initiative. So this is one of our main targets, one of our main goals. And uh, so this is why it's important to have uh, uh, experts and, main, and research scientists from uh, all around the globe. So we can have mangroves from different regions and we can compare, try to find out if they're actually a core microbiome. And seems that this is the case. And, and you have also, of course, the others, uh, the, the variants that you can have in different ecosystems. Uh, and I agree. And for the uh, desert regions, um, uh, uh, there is, a, I don't know if you heard about the Extreme Microbiome Project. It's a similar uh, thing. Because now yeah. we have a big consortium. So I'm, I'm, one, of, one, I'm one, of, one of the members. Okay, so that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just joined this uh, a few months ago. Yeah. And I think this, I mean, I mean, this is that's the, the way nowadays. You have a huge consources, so we can have people from different expertise, different resources, different environment. Yeah. When we combine now those you know, scientists using okay. the, you know a framework that's that's the best way yeah. so i'm really I, I believe that this uh can be applied also in the desert we might might have some core microbiome and there are some few publications showing that yeah, you know? yeah. I've, been, I've, been, I've been speaking with scott side as well from yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's something yeah. Sure. Scott, I'm I'm like, <laughs> yeah uh, that was uh november he's coming in on november yeah right Thank you, Alex. So looking forward to collaborating with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Bye. And over to the MC. Okay, thank you, Pak Ali Budi Kusuma, for your uh, question. Now we move to next question. We got a meeting chat. How is the PGPR mechanism capable of degrading oil through biostimulation treatment? Is there any fundamental manipulation of micro microbial life pattern? It's from risky and no risk pathology. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. In the, in that particular consort, what we uh, uh we applied, we use we selected some microbes <laughs> with plant growth promoting uh, features. So some uh, half of the consortia, let's put like this this way, are uh, microbes able to uh, increase or to improve the plant growth of mangrove plants in that case. And the other half of the consortium are microbes that are not directly able to uh, increase or to improve the plant growth status, but are microbes, or were microbes able to degrade different fractions of oils, uh, of, of the oil, you know? So we combine both uh, different microbes, some helping the plant, and some of them degrading the oil. And the combination was amazing because they, I, we believe that they create a protective environment. So we start the degradation of the oil that was heavily toxic for the plants. And so the good microbes were able to help those plants start to grow. You know, in during these uh, two years and a half, they degrade the oil. And so the plants were getting more and more healthier conditions to grow in that mangrove. And uh, remember, uh, I mentioned before, before our approach, our application of our consortium, the uh, oil company, uh, they were they were trying to recover, to revegetate that mangrove, but without the good microbes, just planting the trees. And the, the, the rate of mortality was 95%, 90, 90, 95. 95%. So this is uh, unbelievable. I mean, you know, the, the, the combination was really the must, uh, a very important combination. And, 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 uh, and um, yeah, and uh, you can rely on some other aspects like biostimulation. Uh, it was not the case in that mangrove. We also tested the biosimulation. So biosimulation is um, because when you have, especially in oil spill, you have an excess of uh, carbon because it's a lot of hydrocarbon get into the system, the ecosystem. And so you have an imbalance. And we have sometimes, depending on the environment, we have uh, we must add more nitrogen. So you have a carbon-nitrogen ratio that is okay, good for the degradation, or sometimes we have uh, to add some phosphate to have a CNP 
rate of that we you know allow the degradation of the compound this is this is actually the main problem in most of ecosystem when we have a huge oil spill so and and you see well the oil is still there so we have microbes that are able to degrade but the excess of carbon i mean it's so high the amount of carbon that you, you need to add some other nutrients especially nitrogen is the main thing and so this is biosimulation uh, we tested, but in that particular mangrove, nitrogen and phosphate were not limiting, uh, limiting uh, nutrients. You know, so uh, the, just increasing the number of microbes in the consortia was uh, good enough to uh, to help that mangrove. But I mean, maybe this is not the case in some other ecosystems. So this is why I mentioned this uh, precision treatment. Uh, each case is a different case. And uh, maybe some other mangroves or some other ecosystem you need to, uh, we will need to rely on uh, not only the consortia, uh, consortia of microbes, but also in uh, adding some uh, nutrients in biosimulation process. You know, so it's a case by case uh, uh, um, situation, I think. I, I hope I answered your question, but thank you. Okay. Any feedback from Risky and Nuris? Okay, we move to Gifano Isagi Yulianto. Uh, I invite you to asking directly. Is it okay? Gifano Isagi Yulianto. Okay, I will read if it's not possible. First of all, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Gifano Isagi Yulianto from uh, HPT, Brawijaya University student. I have a question based on my internship experience in Banyuwangi area of Indonesia. It's uh, the east of uh, Java Island. Uh, with treatment using mic microbacteria with the product name MA11. Uh, I applied it to a soil depth of 20 cm and I measured it with a nutrient measuring instrument and it was still not optimal for planting numbers. The question is, what is the depth of the soil, hot or cold climate condition and soil texture can influence the growth of mic microbe in a field? Okay. Yeah, the depth of uh, Alex. Yeah, it's also a very tough question, actually. <laughs> yeah, because I think this view depends on the yeah, the different ecosystems. Like, uh, I can uh, talk about those uh, mangroves as an example. Um, we, uh, in the beginning, we were applying microbes that were isolating the surface of the mangrove. So I'm talking about zero to uh, five centimeters. And uh, in, in, especially when you talk about oil degradation, in mangroves, the majority of process are uh, carried on by uh, aerobic microbes. So actually, they thrive in the first millimeters of uh, you know the layer, first two to three millimeters of the surface of uh, mangrove sediment. And uh, when we start to dig deeper, you start to have more anaerobic process, and we. We, we now we are getting a lot of information about those processes, but uh, it's still uh, a, a long way to go. We know that uh, some microbes they, they, they can uh, uh, process in different uh, ways and they can degrade the oil, for instance, uh, using different metabolic pathways in anaerobiosis, anaerobiosis. And uh, our last uh, consortium, we are also applying some of those anaerobic microbes. So it's, it's, it's challenging because it's difficult to work with uh, those microbes on deep layer uh, soil. Um, because usually they, 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 especially in mangroves, because they have this uh, ana anaerobiosis uh, ana process. But uh, we are able now to 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 build some consources using also not only aerobic but also some anaerobic microbes. And I mentioned this that we also include in now some uh, fungi. And uh, so far we are still testing in the lab. We are not applying the field, 
much yet, but uh, there, there are some very interesting good results with some of the consortia. So we are trying to understand, because this is something that we are doing in our lab. I mean, we are not only testing in the CDR, oh, it's working or not working. We are trying to understand the molecular mechanisms, you know, like applying the metabolomics and all the omics to try to uh, fine tune the mechanisms and try, because if you understand the mechanism, what, what, what is happening, what's going on there, you can maybe try, you know, to modulate or to modify or to manipulate. I don't like the word manipulate, but you can modulate uh, the microbiome in the future to have uh, your goals. But uh, again, I, I don't know if I have the answer for your question because it's a very tough question. It depends on the environment, depending on a lot of factors. But I know that when you start to dig deeper, it uh, become more complex, the, the, the you know, the the process when you try to, to understand. But I wish you uh, very good luck. And if you have a good results, a good data, please share with me because I really interested in, the, you know, in those uh, microbial uh, communities that we have uh, below 25 uh, centimeters and, and so on. Thank you for your question. Very good. Okay. Thank you. I believe this question is very tough because uh, yeah. uh, depend on the aim or the methods that exactly. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. conduct. Okay. Yeah. For uh, Gifano Isagi Yulianto, please uh, discuss more about this in uh, outside of our agenda, maybe also with your supervisor. Uh, we move to the next uh, uh, question from Adit and Afina, what are the direct and indirect impacts of anthropogenic pressures on the mangrove ecosystem? And how do they affect ecosystem surface such as carbon storage and coastline stabilization? Furthermore, what are the strategic approach regarding the mangrove microbiome initiative research? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you again for the question. Yes, uh, the, we are uh, stressing all the ecosystems a lot nowadays, especially the mangroves. As I mentioned, it's a very sensitive environment and the anthropogenic stress are huge. And uh, and this is uh, really, uh, I mean, we are really worried about that because we, are, uh, uh, we have now uh, 50 or 6% less mangroves that we had before. And we are destroying our mangroves in an accelerated rate. So we must uh, uh, rely on some other approach, some sustainable approach. And one important thing here is that everything is really connected. So when we stress and when we destroy a mangrove, this will also impact the coral reefs. You know, there is a strong connection, connectivity between different ecosystems. And uh, I mean, so we are talking about the mangroves. So this is terrible. The coral reefs will also be affected by a destruction in the in the in the mangrove, and so you have a cascade effect, and this will lead to uh, um, less uh, fish, less shrimp, less crab, less food, and people will starve. And uh, you know, so it's a really it's a connection that we must uh, we must see. Uh, and uh, the microbes, the microbiome. So this, I mean, there are some other initiatives I know, but I mean, uh, the mangrove microbiome initiative is the first one that I believe, as far as I know, that we have, you know, different people with common goals and we decide to have a moment together to discuss how can we leverage and the power of the microbes to help all those uh, challenges that the, ma the, the mangroves, in particular the mangroves, are facing nowadays with anthropogenic factors, stress. And uh, the microbes, they can help a lot, I'm sure, about that. And uh, But again, uh, this must, uh, we must have uh, strong you know, policies, like uh, the, the governments should have a very strong policy to protect those in such environments such ecosystems. So this is the most important thing. And to build those policies, and this is my point again here, uh, we must include the microbes, the microbiome into the equation because they actually are the main players, the main you know players when you think about the biogeochemical cycles in every ecosystem, including the mangroves. 
So how can we talk about sustainability, conservation, restoration without microbes? I mean, there's, uh, for a microbiologist, it makes no sense. But what I think it's beautiful to see, um, if you uh, follow the, the COP conferences, the conference uh, part and uh, United Nations conference on uh, climate change or biodiversity, uh, each conference you can see more microbiologists talking about the power of microbiomes or the microbes into these uh, different systems. And this is beautiful because it's not only about animals and plants and humans, uh, but it's also about the microbes that actually live in, and, and, and allow us uh, to be here in, in this planet. So yes, I think it's extremely important. Thank you for your question because it's also good to uh, showcase the microbes and spread the word, uh, you know, anytime we have uh, the, the, the chance. Okay, thank you for the question, Afina Fitzi for TV from Adit and Afina. So I believe that uh, talking about mangrove, it's uh, one of interesting and important because I heard that mangrove can keep the carbon three or four times uh, uh, regard, uh, I mean, three or four four times uh, compared to another uh, forest region or area. So we move to next question from Farik and Salwa, pathology. Uh, how does the chemical structure of the sideroporous relate to its ability to interact with iron? And how does the environment affect sideroporous? Uh, Prof. Aleph. Yeah, very, yeah. It's an interesting question. And again, I, I, I don't have the answer for this now. We are still uh, trying to understand this, therefore, uh, that I showed before. Um, yeah, there are several different therefores, some of them are well known. And uh, we know that they have a special structure that can uh, calculate, that can uh, capture the, the iron in the special mechanism. This is well known. But uh, that's therefore that we I, I showed before. We are still uh, now in the chemical. We are trying to characterize. I mean, I'm not expert in, in the chemical structure of those uh, 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 compounds or, or molecules, but I'm um, collaborating now with some colleagues that are more from the biochemistry perspective. And uh, we are trying to solve this uh, puzzle to try to understand, because especially that particular, therefore, that I showed before in this uh, uh, fungi, in this that, that we isolated from now have a crater, from a volcanic crater, it's an extremely powerful, therefore, because it's, uh, you know, uh, collating iron in a very strong way. Uh, that could be also interesting for some of biotech applications. But this is still a work in progress. So we still don't know exactly the mechanism for that particular sidorophore, how, how it's, uh, 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 you know, being so powerful to collate, uh, to, to capture the, the, the iron in that particular regulate from Mars. And, uh, and the other question is, uh, this uh, fungi will be able to uh, transfer these uh, nutrients to a plant if we include the plant in the system. So this will be the next, uh, you know, uh, experiments that we are planning uh, for maybe next year, you know, because now we are just trying to improve the the the, the soil uh, conditions, applying those microbes, and see if if we can have a similar effect that we have in desert biocrusts here, and uh, and if works as is. Uh, seems that we will, uh, we will have some interesting data, I don't know. But if it works, we can include, we can think about include the plant in the system. So we can actually start a new, uh, uh, you know, chapter of this, uh, this study. And we are actually planning some collaborations for next year uh, with uh, UC Davis, University of California Davis, because they also are planning, uh, they, they have some experiments now, they actually built a, um, uh, um, also a Mars simulator uh, chamber and it, 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 to, you know trying to grow plants in a similar condition that we could have on Mars or uh, let's see I mean so I, 
you know, it'd be challenging. It'd be interesting. It's, it, again, it's also, uh, I forgot to mention, this is also a NASA uh, supported project because they, they, they are really planning to, uh, you know, to grow plants on an international space station or in a greenhouse on a moon surface, or if you have a colony there in the future, or in a greenhouse in, uh, in, on Mars surface, who knows? But this will take long, I think, but we can apply the same principles, the same micro, the same approaches here on our planet. And so this is actually why I want to see. Uh, I don't know if I will see a Mars colony, you know, or or people living on Moon. But I I I think we can apply the same uh, technology and approaches and microbes here on our planet, and the same technology that we are planning to apply on Mars or you know some other place. But we can apply it here in the easiest way because we don't need the rockets, uh, you know, to transfer people or material or something like that. We are here. It's still challenging, but I mean, uh, we can apply in the easiest way uh, in desert ecosystems or environments or our divisions and, and so on. So this is what I think it's a win-win game. You know, we are learning the process and we can apply here, maybe in the easiest way. In the near future, I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Alex, uh, I apologize for the interruption uh, for our Q&A session. Uh, I believe that uh, and I genuinely appreciate uh, knowledge, knowledge uh, transfer and informative presentation from Pa Alex and also interactive uh, Q&A yeah. session. But uh, we have no approximately uh, time. Uh, I mean, uh, as we approach the conclusion of today's event, uh, I would like to express our sincere appreciation uh, to Pa Alex and our all our attendants. Uh, for Pa Alex, uh, you are welcome to provide some conclusion remarks from you yeah, for no, this session. I just want to thank you again for this uh, amazing opportunity. It's always a pleasure uh, to talk about microbes and actually a pleasure to be with you guys because I always have fun talking about those, uh, uh, you know, uh, application of microbes and, and especially the extreme microbes. And if you have any extra question, just uh, you can just email uh, me and I will be more than happy to answer. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much again. It's always nice to be here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, once again, I extend my profound gratitude to Alex and all the esteemed participants for their active uh, Q and A session, uh, and my role as a moderator for this afternoon session. I humbly uh, offer my apolo apologize for any mistake. Uh, and see you next time. Uh, before uh, drawing our session, uh, my I kindly remind to all audience to kindly complete the attendance seat and meeting chat uh, because it will be closed at uh, 4 p.m. And before drawing our session to a close uh, this afternoon session, allow me to announce that our next session is scheduled for the upcoming Monday, uh, specifically two weeks from today, on September 25. Uh, your presence at the forthcoming session would be great, greatly appreciated. Okay, uh, thank you all for your time and participant. Uh, until we meet again uh, for the next session, Please take care and have a splendid day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much, Professor Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you and see you next time. Okay, see you next time, Alex.
Terima kasih Pak Arief. Oke okay, Ibu Yohana. J. Isin Lab.